Hi, and welcome to our talk. My name is Jimmy Angelakos, and we're going to be discussing neurodiversity and how it affects uh, interactions within uh, the workplace and the IT community in general. What prompted this talk was the fact that I noticed many people were anxious, depressed. They had trouble with their employers. They had trouble interacting with their teams. And I reached out on social media to collect these stories. And one of the people that wrote back was Floor. Absolutely. I, I did. Uh, I saw your uh, call for like input and experiences. Uh, and I had just given an internal talk about my ADHD diagnosis and how I've been basically coping with something that I, you know, had all of my life, but I only found out about uh, in late, uh, fairly late in, in life, right? Um, and asked if we could do a talk about it together. Um, and we talked some more and figured we should submit something to present. So the talk is called How to Work with Other People. We discussed what prompted it. The other question for anyone who knows me is, what's wrong with Jimmy? Why isn't this a technical talk? Um, <laughs> but um, moving on, there's a very clear lack of awareness in IT circles around mental health issues. And that leads to unnecessary stress, as we mentioned. It leads to strained relationships with your colleagues, uh, with your employees, Um it leads to burnout. It leads to people leaving companies and having this churn of people moving from company to company. It leads to conflict and strife within open source projects. And so if we can move back to the previous slide, please. Um, it's really important to say uh, that understanding how different things affect different people differently what do we mean when we say that um, neurotypical, when we're talking about neurodiversity and mental health, is a bit of a misnomer, right? Everyone's brain is wired a little bit differently. And being accommodating to neurodivergent people has benefits for them, but for everyone in general, because everyone stands to benefit from having, let's say, clearer instructions or having better calendar management or the option to drown out the noise in the office, right? So this is why we reached, reached out to peers in the PostgreSQL community to get their stories and get their feedback on this issue. So the goal here is to contribute to a wider understanding of what makes your team members tick. And after this talk, please, by all means, we invite you to give us your stories and your feedback. So I'm a systems and database architect. Um, I've used Postgres exclusively as a database for 16 years and open source in general for more than 25 years. I've written an extension called PG Statavis and a couple of books on Postgres called PostgreSQL Mistakes and How to Avoid Them and the PostgreSQL 16 Administration Cookbook. And I have been diagnosed late in life uh, with autism spectrum disorder, which was a revelation in the sense that the signs were there, but until you read about them or you hear someone talking about them, you don't recognize them. You don't go to speak to a professional and find out what it means. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm happy to join Jimmy for this talk. Uh, I do open source community work at uh, Ivan. Uh, Postgres is a large part of what we do. Uh, I used to work at Microsoft Grafana Labs, uh, always in developer relations types of roles. I'm a serial conference and meetups organizer because I love getting together with people. Uh, and I always think that I have too much time on my hands. Uh, hence, my maybe my uh, ADHD diagnosis also later in, in life. Um, I had heard about ADHD before. Uh, my mom is a primary teacher. I heard all about it uh, for, for a really long time. Uh, but it took me uh, watching someone else do a talk on ADHD in their discovery journey. Um, and they said something that really stuck with me. They said that there was only two times for them now and not now. And finally, sort of like everything made sense because that's exactly how I felt as well. Um, and I figured out that that's maybe why I have trouble 
planning ahead uh, and making sure I make deadlines. So before we go any further, I want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, as a disclosure, neither Jimmy nor I are doctors. So we're speaking from experience here and we're relaying the experience of some of the Postgres community members that they've shared with us. Um, but by no means, this is any medical advice. And also as a trigger warning, we might use some ableist language in one of our slides, but that's just to pr prove a point. Uh, so I really hope that we don't offend anyone. And then also before we move on, we it is a little bit time for, for definitions, right? So I want to make sure that we, we catch those too. Um, what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is a word that is used to explain uh, the unique ways in which uh, people's brains work. So while all of our brains develop it similarly, uh, no two brains are exactly uh, alike. Um, and being neurodivergent just means having a brain that functions different from the average brain, right? So from, from a neurotypical person. Um, because it's not an external condition, you can't see that someone is not neurodiverse. Um, it's invisible in that way. And it also makes it much harder to talk about it and to remember to consider. Um, how prevalent is it then? Well, between 15 and 20% of people have uh, a neurodiversity or are neurodivergent. This includes up to 10% people that have dyslexia, 5% of people that uh, have ADHD, and 1% to 2% with autism. Um, and despite many autistic people uh, being very talented and qualified and willing to work, only 29% of the uh, global population with autism uh, are full-time employed and oftentimes in positions that they're actually overqualified for. Um, then there's comorbidity. That's when uh, one condition uh, occurs alongside with, an, with another condition that you have been diagnosed with. Um, and sometimes the effect is a, is a mix that will make you being perceived by others as difficult to work with. Uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Then masking or camouflaging. That's when you're trying to suppress, um, for instance, autistic traits to appear uh, neurotypical. Uh, and that can lead to discomfort for long periods of time while you're suppressing things that are an integral part of you. Uh, and that can lead to comorbidities uh, like feelings of depression or anxiety. Um, and often people that are already underrepresented in technology um, do a lot more masking and only find out about their uh, diagnosis later in life. It's so you may have already grasp that from our abstract, but times are hard uh, for people in IT. There's been mass layoffs recently. There's been restructuring of companies. There are few entry-level positions. Everyone wants 10 years experience on technologies that are five years old. Um, the job descriptions and interviews aren't ideal for neurodiverse people. Uh, we've had, if you, if you ever remember this time, uh, for a couple of years, had to work from home, uh, which led, meant that people were isolated and lost the connections they'd made at work. Uh, and then even worse, uh, when everyone was talking about how great it was that finally companies have embraced uh, remote work, um, those same companies ordered people to return to the office. And the mandatory return to office um, really caused some issues. And uh, so we had the anxiety and depression of people looking for work, uh, hopelessness and despair where, when the positions weren't suitable for them, uh, which leads to feel feelings of inadequacy and or imposter syndrome. Maybe I'm not good enough for this position. Um, also, Staying away from the work environment, from the office, meant that some people lost the structure that they needed to structure their day around. Uh, and then when uh, other people were forced to return to the office uh, after they had adjusted to working from home, then they had to deal with uh, distractions and noise and other things that come with uh, things such as open plan offices, let's say. So let's talk a little bit about the conditions uh, that we're talking about. Now, depression is super prevalent. Uh, it means you have extremely low energy for most people. 
difficulty concentrating, a sense of emptiness and despair, or being on the verge of tears uh, almost all the time. So it's not feeling sad. Depression is something beyond that. It, It brings lack of motivation and pleasure in doing things, even those things that were previously uh, very enjoyable for that person. Now, moving on to the autism spectrum, um, many people know that autistic people have difficulty in social interaction. Uh, Just the other day, someone said, I'm afraid to ask you, Jimmy, uh, because you're scary. And that is just one of the perceptions that get created, you know, when when you have poor social interaction skills or... um... Uh, Anyway, moving on, uh, hyper-focus is a trait that autistic people have. And this is uh, related to something we call monotropism, which is the inability to pull oneself away from uh, what they're doing or what they're thinking about at that time. Um, Generally speaking, uh, Autistic people set very high standards for themselves and then get very disappointed when they can't live up to those impossibly high standards, right? There's a constant internal pressure to do better and the tendency to take on too much work, which is then exploited sometimes by employers who just say, okay, uh, they can manage, let's just give them more work and more work. And that, of course, as we all know, leads to burnout. Uh, There are comorbidities, there are things that are associated with autism spectrum disorder, like um, anxiety and depression. Uh, can, and there's also a significant overlap with ADHD in some cases. And let's hear from Flora about ADHD. Uh, excellent. Uh, yeah, so ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, um, and that's an executive dysfunction. Um, so executive function helps you manage uh, things like focus and concentration, uh, emotional regulation, uh, self-motivation. And so people with ADHD struggle with all of those functions to degrees varying, of course, on the individual. Uh, there are several subtypes. Uh, for uh, There is inattentive, uh, hyperactive and impulsive, or there is the mix. Uh, but you might know these people as either the dreamer, you can't reach them, or the person that can't sit still on a chair. Um, some some things that come with ADHD is, for instance, time blindness. Uh, that's a term that is used to describe the difficulty that people with ADHD have in perceiving and managing their time, and that could lead to challenges with punctuality uh, and with planning. Um, there's also that tendency to take on too much, but just because you don't really know all of the other things that you have already taken on and where you might get into trouble uh, time-wise. So there is a risk of burnout there too. Um, people with ADHD also f- often struggle with feelings of depression, anxiety, uh, substance abuse because they try and self-medicate uh, and eating disorders uh, as well. So let's look into a couple of situations where you uh, where those kind of like uh, neurodiversities come into play uh, even more. Um, so say, for instance, the uh, situation where your manager asks you to meet in an hour. Now, a neurotypical person would look at this request and think, uh, think to look at their calendar, see if they have time in an hour, probably plan in that meeting and send their a manager a meeting invite. A person with ADHD, however, thinks, hmm, an hour, Probably I have time because I don't really know what I'm going to do in an hour. I won't check my calendar. I won't necessarily send out a calendar invite, but only think like, huh, in that hour, there's all these things that I could do. Oh, look, my inbox is full. Let me respond to this very urgent looking request. Forget about the meeting and then be prompted an hour later by my manager asking, weren't we supposed to meet? Another situation is a colleague who would ask you, do you have five minutes now or are you open to feedback? Now, where you request with like that without any context, like you could have said, do you have five minutes to discuss uh, or to share with me how you did that travel request for uh, PG Day uh, New York? Uh, because I, I'm looking into also going there and I, I think you just did that and you could maybe share how you've done that. Like giving that, that, that sort of like context to your request makes it a lot less uh, open to interpretation, and so a lot less stressful. 
this goes uh, for neurotypical person or typ typical people as much as for people with neurodiversities, of course. So adding some context to your request is very, very helpful. Then another situation where a colleague might use uh, ableist language, um, that is to anyone with neurodiverse and uh, who is neurodiverse might feel like I am not normal. I am a joke. I will never fit in. And that can be incredibly uh, hurtful because this is a condition and it's not a meme. Right. So some other mental health issues that we skipped over, but are worth mentioning and neurodiversity uh, conditions are like dyslexia is really prevalent. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, we just mentioned Tourette's syndrome. Um, many people that are neurodivergent have melatonin deficiencies, and that means they have erratic sleep patterns, which makes them not a morning person. So in some people's minds, lazy. And this brings us to the social stigma of uh, acknowledging mental health issues. Um, you will have noticed that in whenever there's a news report about crime, and if mental illness is uh, present in the perpetrator, it is always mentioned, right? So that brings to some people the fear of being singled out as crazy, and it makes them afraid to speak out on their condition and how they feel about uh, the workplace or team they're working in because they fear that that will affect their employment or their career prospects. Also uh, present in a community that is close to our heart and even the Postgres girl community, uh, we have to say that words matter. So when someone contributes to the discourse or they contribute a code patch and they get feedback like, that's stupid or that's nonsense, neurodivergent people already have enough self-worth issues and imposter syndrome, as we mentioned, and that certainly doesn't help. Maybe that person will be put off contributing from the project for life if they get treated that way. But also, if you share your condition, and this is uh, some a real story that one of the people sharing with us said, when they shared their condition with their workplace, uh, they had a heartwarming acceptance and support from their colleagues. Now, it doesn't logically make sense that everyone should have the, sk the same skills and aptitudes. Are you listening, employers? And also, it doesn't make sense that you can accommodate someone's broken limb, but you can't accommodate their anxiety and depression. So maybe you can work fewer hours for less pay is not an accommodation. Finally, when it comes to hiring people that are neurodiverse, um, it, having people that think differently in your team can literally uh, break the danger of group. Uh, there are skills associated with neurodiversity, like dyslexic people are really good at seeing the bigger picture and big concepts and ideas. ADHD, uh, people that have ADHD are quick problem solvers, and they're very agile. Uh, autistic people deliver really high quality work with attention to detail. So everyone's bringing something different to the table depending on their uh, skills and aptitudes. But neurodivergent people usually self-select away from companies because of the job description and because... Um, People ask for things such as uh, a bubbly uh, data center manager or a sociable data center manager, right? Things that have nothing to do with the job description. But if someone reads that and thinks, oh, I don't tick that box, therefore I'm not suitable for that job, they won't apply. So um, that's something to think about. And also, uh, sorry, if we can go back to the previous slide, not everyone thinks that uh, the same things are desirable perks in a job, right? So um, it's not everyone's cup of tea to have uh, beer in the office uh, on Fridays or foosball, right? That it's much more important to be accommodating and understanding about people's uh, mental differences. And this brings us to uh, 
changing these attitudes in companies, which is really hard. And sometimes it feels like the HR department is not there to help. Uh, so it's better to internalize those things and try the try them out with your colleagues, with your team, uh, because that will eventually make enough people aware of the issues that it will spread the companies as well, hopefully. Yeah, and we want to dive into a couple of those tips that were on the, the previous slide. One of the things that I um, mentioned when I did my internal talk about my ADHD uh, is uh, some of the sort of like coping me mechanisms that I that I use, and a lot of people found them incredibly helpful. Uh, again, not only neuro neurodiverse people. So one thing that I use is body doubling, um, and body doubling is when you hold each other accountable by doing a thing together. So, for example, my expenses are due, and I absolutely hate doing my my expenses. Um, and I used to refer it even as my ADHD tax. That is the money that I lost by uh, just every fiber in my body resisting opening up that expense program. Um, so with body doubling, I find someone else who also needs to do their expenses or has another chore that they're really, really like fighting uh, against doing. Um, we open up a video call, we open up a chat, we do the thing uh, we tell each other that we've done the thing, we celebrate each other for do doing the thing, and then we go about our day. Um, and so now at Ivan, the Employee Resource Group for Neurodiversity has actually set aside time every week so that people can just dial in and do the body, body doubling together, whatever task they need to get done, um, and get it done, literally. Another thing that I think is incredibly helpful um, is writing your own readme. So sometimes like talking about the thing that you have might be very difficult for people, uh, but maybe writing about it is a lot easier. And especially when you can do that by writing your own readme. So hopefully we're all familiar with readmes because we write at least that level of documentation for our projects, right? Uh, but if you write a readme to, for yourself, that is incredibly helpful because it's almost like an internal cheat sheet for knowing how everyone prefers to work together. Um, and so it's important that everybody in the company does it and it's shared in a very, uh, in a central place that is accessible to everyone. So maybe on your wiki, um, your, your notion, your intranet, whatever you're using. It's standardized questions um, to literally question your preferences. And it's absolutely wild how we don't think about it before we are answering those questions. Um, maybe as a bonus, take time to walk through these readmes together with your team members to add some context to these. Uh, so I put some resources on the slide where you can find some of those uh, type of readmes templates. Another thing that is incredibly important is the uh, is timeout or time, time off. Um, so a Postgres community member shared with us because they um, love to be around people, but it's also very exhausting. Um, and um, when stuff gets too much, when they get overwhelmed, uh, their body reacts and they, they start crying. And that can be completely normal to you as an individual, but it can be feel, feel a bit embarrassing and it's uh, not always very comfortable for everyone around you. Um, making sure that you have a quiet space that you can retreat to when things are too much is incredibly helpful. So for instance, when your work includes a lot of traveling, uh, making sure that you book a hotel that is close to or at the venue where you need to be uh, so that you always have a place that you can retreat to is incredibly important. Um, also taking time off. Uh, one one of our community members uh, tells us that they have taken very little time off work over the years, partly because of their perfectionist tendencies and partly because there is a stigma attached to mental health issues and taking time off because of it. Uh, and they were worried about being seen as weak or unstable or not good enough at their work. Uh, particularly unhelpful, I have found, are un unlimited vacation days because especially neurodiverse people tend to not take those when they already feel like they are being a burden. Um, and purely speaking for myself, uh, if I have unlimited vacation days, I will simply lose track of how many days I've taken. I feel like I've probably taken too much already, even if I probably didn't take any uh, near the amount that one should actually take to fully recharge. Um, I want to mention assume good intent because really most people mean well. Nobody wants you to fail. Um, 
But as a person underrepresented in tech, again, I would like to add that make sure that you cover your basis as well. Try to find your community at work, uh, maybe in that employee resource group, sorry for that horrible acronym, or a special interest group um, and find your community there and make sure that they can support you. Other things you can do is practice empathy for other people. So you can schedule messages or emails to be posted during working hours. Uh, my personal favorite is when someone tells me what we should do next week on a Friday evening as I'm signing off of work. Uh, that's not stressful at all. And uh, people can also write and maintain wikis that explain to people uh, how things in the company work so that they don't feel lost. In the workplace, in the office, uh, you can practice low lighting and low noise environments. These are helpful to uh, lots of people. And you should probably accommodate uh, these things by default so people don't have to beg you for noise-canceling headphones. Right, or you can have fidget devices uh, laying around on the, in the office so that people don't have to ask for them. And most importantly, you have to listen instead of immediately offering solutions. Right, so when someone says I'm dyslexic, then don't immediately recommend, oh, use a spell checker and that that will solve everything. How come so, I never thought about that? <laughs> these are uh, places you can find us. Um, online. Yeah, I would love to chat more. And these are resources that are really important. Um, there's a really important book, a podcast, uh, a legendary article on HuffPost, and there's also warnings associated with um, online mental health care, right? So you need to make sure that you protect your privacy, you protect your sensitive data, uh, there have been fines associated with these platforms. So make sure you use someone that's approved by your health authority and uh, that you are speaking to someone licensed, right? You, you should speak by all means about your condition and the way you feel to friends, to professionals. Don't keep it all inside because otherwise you may never find out uh, what your limitations are, what your capabilities are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're very grateful to Posette for inviting us. And we want to thank you for uh, tolerating us during this talk. Hopefully, you can use this information, uh, whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, um, for to improve uh, your experience and other people's experience as well. And we do believe that the PostgreSQL community does stand to gain from uh, opening this discussion and keeping it open. Thank you very much.